Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the much-delayed 2020 annual church meetings. Thank you for using your evening to be here and braving the dark and the wet. We are going to be recording this meeting and um, broadcasting it through the website. None of you will appear on camera because the camera is pointed directly at the lectern, uh, but we may hear your dulcet tone should you choose to ask a question. So hopefully um, that shouldn't bother anybody too much. Today's, or this evening's meetings fall into four parts, four part harmony if you like. The first is the annual church meeting and the sole item of business is the election of church wardens. That will be followed by the annual parochial church meeting and as you'll see from your agenda, that consists of annual reports and election and appointment of officers. Then we're going to have a little order of service at that point, a little act of worship. And at the end of the act of worship, um, everybody except the new parochial church council is free to depart. We're going to have a short PCC meeting um, directly after the act of worship. So I think that's all for the moment. Um, I'm now going to ask Jeanette to begin, us, begin this meeting with a prayer. To begin with, we'll just hold a few moments of silence with our own thoughts and prayers. Almighty God, we come together this evening in the service of your church to remember with thanksgiving all that you have been able to do through us in this parish during the past year and to seek your guidance in the elections for the coming year. We pray that this may be something more than just a business meeting, but rather an occasion when we receive fresh encouragement in our work, catch a wider vision of your purpose and dedicate ourselves anew to your service. We ask this in the name of him who came to this world not to be served but to serve and gave his life as a ransom for many. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We've got two microphone stations uh, in action this evening, this one and the microphone down by the cross aisle. We're going to keep microphone usage to a minimum. If you do later on want to ask a question, um, I think the method is that you either go to the microphone after which we will wipe it, uh, with <laughs> which is not to cast dispersions on anybody, or uh, Chris, I think, may well be relaying questions over the microphone so that everybody can hear what's being asked. Is that okay? But I'll leave the two Chris's down that end of the church to, to supervise that part of the proceedings. We move then to uh, the first of two meetings tonight, or three if you count the first meeting of the PCC. The annual parish meeting, as I said earlier, is there to elect two church wardens, and that's the sole item of business. It is open to anybody in the parish who wishes to come, uh, not just members of the church. Now then, this could be a big anticlimax. Uh, I should explain at this point that uh, the past year has been a year in which we've been served, well, a year and a bit now, in which we've been served wonderfully well by the two Chrises, Chris Brown and Chris Cheeseman, and they have gone the extra mile as we've negotiated our way through some very challenging times. So on behalf of all of us here and those who may be watching at home, those beyond these walls, 
uh, I'd like to say a huge public thank you to both for the work they've put in and the service they've rendered to this church. So can we first of all give them a round of applause as a vote of thanks. Which brings us to the nail-biting moment, the election of two wardens. We've only had two duly signed forms, and one's in the name of Chris Brown, and the other's in the name of Chris Cheeseman. <laughs> <laughs> so all that soft soap I said earlier <laughs> um, has brought reward. Um, so, because they're the only names in the frame, we don't need to have an election, clearly, so I would like to, with your support, declare, to declare both of them duly elected to serve for another year. So can you raise your hands if you're content with that decision? Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back, Chris and Chris, and uh, we look forward to an interesting time ahead. Thank you very much indeed for standing once again. Thank you. That brings us then to the annual parochial church meeting. We've had uh, several apologies and I've now, well, here's my list. We have apologies from Richard Lusty, Anne Robertson, Sue Harvey, Margaret Roylance, Roy Isworth, Neil and Jill de Villiers. Jill's apparently still partying. That is her birthday and the celebrations are in full swing and for some strange reason, she didn't want to come to an annual meeting. Uh, Chris and June Teasdale and Sue Goff. Are there any more apologies before we, before we move on? No, thank you. Minutes of the previous annual parochial church meeting. These were distributed um, via email and uh, we've also got some paper copies available. The first thing I've got to ask you is, can we sign them as a correct record of proceedings back in April 2019, which seems an age ago now? So you need even better memories than usual. Are we all content? Someone would like to propose Chris? Yep. And, and Rob, is that Rob back there? It's a job to tell behind these masks. Yeah. Right, so Chris Cheeseman and Rob Easto, proposer and seconding, seconder. All in favour? Thank you very much indeed. Any matters arising? Anybody want to pick up on anything that's in the minutes of that meeting? Anything on page one? Page two? Page three? And lastly, page four. All okay? Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we come now to annual reports. Now, in the uh, documents that were sent out were reports on our worship, mission and ministry, on buildings, on finance, and safeguarding and the big picture group. Now, I don't propose to read all through those, particularly as we are in the circumstances of the moment and everybody's behind a mask. Um, I'm hoping you've had chance to look at those. I will get, um, is Chris Northern here? Oh, there he is there. Uh, I'll get Chris to come up and just say a few words about finance in a moment. But before we move to finance in particular, are there any questions relating to worship, mission and ministry, buildings, safeguarding, or the big picture group? Anything at all anybody wants to ask? Or if anybody who has been instrumental in drawing those reports up wants to come and amplify anything or explain anything? Are we all okay? Good. Chris, can you, do you want to come up and say anything about the annual reports in terms of financial aspects? That's okay. <laughs> um, I'm sh we've got Chris Cheeseman here, who's also on the finance group, and Heinrich. 
So it may well be that Chris might like to. <laughs> I think to speak otherwise you'll never think yourself understood. Live streaming. What's it called? Streaming. The live streaming. Yes. Which is. <laughs> Both. Um, yes. On the inside.
Thank you, Chris and Chris. Good. Um, obviously, tonight isn't your last chance to ask questions, so if you do have any questions beyond this evening, uh, do direct them in this direction, and uh, we will do our best to answer them. So if there are no questions on worship, mission and ministry, buildings, electoral role, safeguarding or the big picture group, we'll move on to the election and appointment of officers. And we come first to members of the PCC. Now, some years ago, we passed a rule that said that we would limit our elected members of the PCC to 12 in number with one third retiring each year. The PCC, it's worth saying, consists of 12 elected members and um, other members who are on by law, and that includes licensed clergy and deanery synod members and, of course, church wardens. But uh, at this point in proceedings, it's all about the 12 elected members of the PCC. Now, standing down this year, after three years' faithful service, are Andrew Bliss, Robin Lovell, Peter Costain and Charlie Nichols, and I think they're all here. So to each and all of them, I'd like to say a big thank you to, and I do that knowing that their involvement in much of what's going to be happening in this church uh, in the near future doesn't end tonight. It's going to carry on, and we're very grateful to them for their time, their expertise, and all the work that they've put in uh, to well, into the life of this church here. Now then, four people who didn't have their arms twisted at all uh, to stand for three years are Mary Monckton, Steve, do you want to, can you stand up? Mary, can you stand up? Steve Curtis, where's Steve? He was here a minute ago. Oh, over there, yes. Um, Caroline Salmon, who is on my left, and Pat Curtis, who comes with Steve. Well, she doesn't come, she doesn't come with Steve, but what I'm trying to say is uh, we're getting too... Oh, I'll give up. <laughs> Dig myself into a hole here. Right, so, um, can I propose then that we elect Mary, Steve, Caroline and Pat? So, would someone also like to propose? Yes. And second, who's that at the back propose? Is that Nick at the back? Nick yep, that's Nick, Nick Hudd and, and Doug Fuller. Proposed and seconded. All in favour? Fabulous. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to Pat and to Steve, to Mary and to Caroline. Thank you very much. Now to the parish safeguarding officer. Now, Jackie Grant was our parish safeguarding officer and uh, Jackie has been doing that job or had been doing that job for quite a long time and decided she'd like a change. And so we had to find a new one. And we did. Now, where's Anne? Anne, would you like to come out? Or stand up, at least. Um, <laughs> are you happy to remove your mask just for the moment? So, <laughs> this, this is Anne Bevan, and we're delighted that Anne has decided to take on the role as safeguarding officer. Uh, Anne didn't take much persuasion either, which was really good. Did you? This is on a trial basis, by the way, isn't it? <laughs> yes. And uh, Anne was uh, a head teacher in a previous life and comes with a huge amount of experience already in safeguarding and has got to grips with the job very quickly. There's been a wonderful handover between Jackie and Anne, very smooth, but we do need officially, which we were supposed to do, of course, back in April, um, we do need officially to uh, appoint Anne as our safeguarding officer. So would someone like to act as proposer? Yep, said Irene. Yes, and seconder? Mary, all in favour? Thank you very much indeed. Wonderful. It's official. It's official. That's brilliant. Um, now, the next item is independent examiner or auditor. And I understand that Kevin Heyman is willing to serve. Is that correct? Thank you, Chris. So, are you proposing, Kevin? Kevin? Okay. Would someone like to second the proposal? Heinrich? And all in favour? And if we can convey our due thanks to Kevin and uh, I don't know, supply him with something to 
warm winter's evenings with a bottle of something, that would be good. But we'll, we'll convey our thanks to, to Kevin. That's really good. Reaffirmation of the safeguarding policy. We have, as all churches must have, a safeguarding policy. And it's the job of the annual meeting to reaffirm that. The policy that we adhere to is that drawn up by the diocese, um, which clearly saves us in a lot of work. Um, Anne, are you happy to recommend that we reaffirm that policy? Okay. No. Well, not unless you desperately want to. Well, we're happy to go with the diocesan one if you're happy with that. We just needed to know that you're content with... Okay, thank you. So would somebody... Anne, would you like to propose that we adopt the diocesan policy and reaffirm that? So Anne's proposing. Someone to second? Charlie Nichols. All in favour? Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we're going to come to any other business, after which we'll have our little act of worship. Um, but before we come to the worship then, are there any other points that anybody wishes to raise? Any questions, concerns, anything at all? You don't have to, it's not obligatory. Chris. Yes, I'd just really like to miss a very strange period of time we've had <coughs> to say a very big thank you to the ministry team. Um, it's been a very unusual time, isn't it? We've had a good 2019 uh, when we had and looked after by Peter Brett, Roy Lapley, by Margaret Rodents, and by Dean Tim Jeanette and Chris Fisher. Um, and that's great because obviously come March this year, things changed dramatically. And we suddenly had a bulletin coming out of us each day, <laughs> and a vital time coming out of us each day with all sorts of new ideas and new things, lovely pictures of the countryside, lovely bits of worship, and really kept us going in a difficult period. And then that's been followed up by Connect Up and the services that we see on we're having church now, but also we see on the website um, uh, or use it through YouTube. And that's really been fantastic. And so we do thank the team for their ministry to us over this extended period. Uh, and in particular, because it serves us all now, the Dennis and Jeanette, and I think Chris was a bit like a technical bit, and a few other people, particularly on you. So we do give you grateful thanks in God's name for all you have done over this time. Uh, and we wish to support you going forward. We know life isn't going to be easy. Life is still going to be a little bit strange in the months ahead. And we would like to support you in any way we can. Uh, and if you need any help, please do shout. But thank you very much indeed. just wanted to say a couple of things about developments. Um, one, as uh, somebody's already mentioned, the stained glass, and we are very grateful to the Friends of St Mildred's for uh, enabling us to undertake work on the most urgent windows, i.e. the one to my right and the one over there to my left, and you'll know that there was scaffolding up until this morning. Uh, the, out, sorry, the interior work on those windows is now complete, hence no scaffolding, but we are awaiting the delivery of window guards in the next month, I think, Chris. That's right, isn't it? And they're going to fit those, so the scaffolding outside will stay. But um, if you look into the gloom behind you, you'll see the west window scaffolding still up, and that's where they're concentrating their efforts at the moment. And then obviously that will come down in due course. So that's a little bit about the stained glass. Um, the period during which people could object to the works identified by Phase 1A has now expired. Phase 1A is the internal redecoration of the building, the removal of the pews, including the uh, north and south aisles, and the levelling of the plinths to floor level. Um, that period of 
uh, objection or during which people could object has now expired and we are now waiting for the registry to issue the faculty which will give us the official permission to remove the pews and carry on with the redecorating. The redecorating, because of the length of time, it's about 12 weeks worth of work, I think, uh, won't take place until after Christmas. So sometime between Christmas and Easter, uh, the place will be given a lick of paint and should look pretty marvellous at the end of it. We have placed an order for the first instalment of our new chairs. Uh, they could take 10 weeks, is it, Andrew, do you think? Um, before they arrive. Um, so at some point, at the end of the, uh, well, by the, when we get the faculty issued, uh, at some point we've got to then to work out the, the um, time scale, you know, the removal of the pews and installation of chairs. So that needs to be worked through, but that's kind of where we are. And then next week, uh, the contractors are coming in to install the streaming technology. There's a slight hold up on the cameras uh, the two cameras but uh, they thought they'd go ahead with everything else and then fit the two cameras when they arrive so I would have thought hopefully uh, by the end of October we should be up and running what we want to do we we've drawn up a, a protocol which has got to be discussed and uh, tweaked which governs the use of the technology how we use it how we safeguard people who don't want to be on camera um, that's got to be finalised and we're going to do some trial runs with the new technology before we go live as it were so that when we do go live we know that everybody is absolutely happy with the technology and the way it's being used. So any fears that you have that your face will appear full screen, uh, hopefully all this uh, preparation will disabuse you of that fear uh, but more about that in due course. So any questions on any of that? I haven't misrepresented anybody, have I? Don't think, no, good. Um, can I just say on behalf of Jeanette and Chris and myself, a huge thank you to everybody for all the wonderful comments, the encouragement, the splendid words, the cards, the little gifts of cake, um, all those things that helped sustain us during the lockdown period. Um, it, we wouldn't have done it if we hadn't had all that encouragement so it is down to you and I'd just like to say thank you too to everybody that's done so much uh, for the life of this church over the past 18 months since the last annual meeting uh, it's at meetings like this that you start to realize the sheer breadth and the numbers of people involved and uh, it is a pretty fantastic place to be I have to say and we are very grateful I know Jeanette is Chris is myself uh, to you all for everything that you do as well so thank you very much indeed and people have really stepped up to the plate during this period and i do applaud each and every one of you thank you now jeanette's got uh, some orders of service uh, when i say orders of service take heart it's not um, an hour in length but a simple form of night prayer with a little homily thrown in we're going to have that little order of service and then those of you who are not on the PCC, if you'd like to uh, leave, if you so wish, and then we'll have our first meeting of the PCC, which will be fairly brief, I would think. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Well, I'll do the, I'll do the service, and you do the candles. Thanks. We've got candles as well. You won't have these on your tablet or phone.
I blow that out. Welcome everybody to our time of prayer and reflection this evening and we will be using this order for night prayer or compline. We're focusing our worship very much around the book of Job and the reasons for that will become clearer during Lindsay's homily. Now the book of Job is considered both a theological and a literary masterpiece. It's an honest portrayal of God allowing a good man to suffer. The test of Job's faith allowed by God in response to a challenge from Satan revealed God's loving sovereignty and the supremacy of divine wisdom over human wisdom, which is personified in the book by Job's friends. Believing that God is good despite the apparent evidence to the contrary Job rested in faith alone. In the depths of agony, he could still proclaim, I know that my Redeemer lives. In the end, God silenced all discussion with the truth that he alone is wise. Yet he vindicated Job's trust in him, proving that genuine faith cannot be destroyed. The unknown author of this book was probably an Israelite who was writing sometime between 1500 and 500 BC. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. And now we keep a time of silence. We reflect on the day that has been, the things we have done, the people we have seen, and the moments where we may have put some distance between ourselves and God in the things that we have thought and said and done. Together we pray. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your spirit and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. 
O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. psalm this evening is verses from psalm 88 you are my refuge my portion in the land of the living O lord god of my salvation i have cried day and night before you let my prayer come into your presence incline your ear to my cry for my soul is full of troubles my life draws near to the land of death. I am counted as one gone down to the pit. I am like one that has no strength. Lost among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave. Whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. Lord, I have called daily upon you. I have stretched out my hands to you. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. You are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. In the depths of our isolation we cry to you, Lord God. Give light in our darkness and bring us out of the prison of our despair. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Chris Brown will now read for us.
The scripture reading is from the book of Job, chapter 19. Oh, that my words were written down. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and with lead they were engraved on a rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side. And my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. If you say how we will persecute him, and the root of the matter is found in him, be afraid of the sword, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, so that you may know there is a judgment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks. be to God. These words are spoken in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. These have been extraordinary months. We have been tested and stretched as individuals, as families, as a community, and as a church. And there are still extraordinary months to come. And all because the coronavirus has become a fact of all our lives. Where is God in all this? For vast numbers of people, both in this country and across the world, these are terrible times. Where is God in the suffering and dying, the loss and the loneliness, the hopelessness and despair that so many are experiencing during this pandemic? And when the world finally emerges from this ordeal, what kind of story will faith tell about it? What difference will it make to the way we believe? The impact of coronavirus in this country is a catastrophe, but it is, of course, also a catastrophe that affects the entire world, which probably makes it unique among natural disasters in our lifetimes. It would be strange if we did not ask what significance lies in what is happening to humanity. Many people are looking for meanings of some kind, whether or not they are derived from organised religion or particular traditions of faith. The quest for meaning in the universe seems so elusive because it appears to function according to principles that are indifferent to human beings. And so our experience at times of trouble is not that the universe is necessarily hostile, simply that it doesn't care. And that is the conclusion drawn by the world-weary author of Ecclesiastes, where what goes round comes round. Nothing is permanent, all is vanity, as light and is insubstantial as air. The wisdom writings of the Hebrew Bible show that faith has to find a way of negotiating the capriciousness of things, living with risk, accident and disaster, turning to the best ends we can, whatever happens to us, whether it is good or bad. This is a universe where things go wrong, disasters happen and life is damaged. But faith affirms that in an ultimate sense, all shall be well, by envisaging how pain, suffering and death are woven into the heart of things. This kind of faith wants to explore how God is present, not above or outside, but within, embedded even in the changes and the chances of existence. The Creator 
is humble and loving enough to be immersed in the fabric of the universe, in the natural processes of the created order, and in our own human life and relationships. Perhaps faith in these times must be more tentative than before, humbler in the face of a universe we know to be profoundly mysterious. Contemporary faith must show the utmost sensitivity to pain. With our awareness of suffering, whether due to natural events or human actions, the existence of a God who is both benign yet in control is more and more difficult to articulate convincingly. To many people who are sympathetic to religious faith, Traditional statements of religion seem not so much impossible as incredible. They want to know what kind of power we are claiming for God when we address him as the Almighty. What we mean when we speak about God's will while human hearts break under the burden of pain and sorrow. We cannot help but ask these sorts of questions. we follow the book of Job, we will conclude that in the end, the problem of suffering is unanswerable. Meanwhile, we have to go on living and very possibly suffering, and if we can, like Job, trusting and praising God. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last, he will stand upon this earth. At a time of catastrophe, the last thing we should do is to find refuge in explanations that sound easy or obvious, if they do not do justice to the complexity of the real world, they are certain to be wrong. To try to reassure a terminally ill patient or someone who has just been bereaved or lost home and livelihood by saying, don't worry, it will be all right in the end, could be an act of real cruelty, not least because it sounds like a denial of what they are experiencing at the time. Indeed, explanations of any kind are not likely to be what is needed in a time of crisis. So, what is needed? Perhaps no more and no less than to care about the welfare of others and to love our neighbours as ourselves. As someone wrote, we have a chance to do something extraordinary. As we head out of this pandemic, we can change the world, create a world of love, a world where we are kind to each other, a world in which we are kind no matter what class, race, sexual orientation, what religion or lack of, or what job we have a world in which we do not judge those at the food bank, because that may be us if things were just slightly different. Let love and kindness be our roadmap. Over the past few months, we have seen countless examples of care and love within our community. There are people here and out there who have faithfully and courageously served others through the work of Ashford Borough Council, Tenterden Town Council, Tenterden Community Hub, Tenterden Social Hub, Tenterden Family Food Bank, helping in Tenterden, in the residential homes, in the surgery, in the shops and the schools and the churches, and in the myriad little acts of kindness that happened all around us as friends and neighbours recognised need and try to meet it. Ordinary people have refused to be cowed by the virus and worked hard to maintain the fabric of our community. The virus has brought untold suffering to so many, but it has also released untold goodness and love that have brought help, lifted spirits and lightened heavy hearts. There is something miraculous in that and very comforting. 
There is something deeply Christ-like in this washing of one another's feet, if we might describe as such these beautiful acts of service. For service is what precisely takes place in the upper room on Maundy Thursday and in the cross of Jesus on Good Friday. In the darkness of Golgotha, he opens his arms wide to embrace the human race, not in a coercive act of naked power, but in the crucified power of love to give itself without limit, to persuade and accept and entice and to draw us to itself. It's what makes love what it is, offers us the lens by which to read the world, convinces us that even the smallest act of service done in the name of love confers meaning and has the potential to transform our vision of life. A few days ago, announcing a five billion escape plan, Chancellor Rishi Sunak urged us to live without fear. To do so is to live in holy defiance and say yes to life, yes to hope, and yes to the future. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian neurologist and psychiatrist and tells of someone in the Warsaw ghetto who placed a pot of brilliant red geraniums on the windowsill above the street. What could be more eloquent than a blaze of colour in a dark and desperate place? Throughout this crisis, people have painted rainbows and lit candles. And we as a church must do all that we can to live, think, speak, pray and worship. To be a brilliant blaze of rainbow colours as the virus re-emerges and the darkness of winter begins to fall. And so raise the hope of all those who pass by. Amen. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, Lord God of truth. I commend my spirit. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wing. Save, Save us, us, O Lord, Lord while, while waking, and guard us while sleeping, that, that awake we may watch with Christ, and, and asleep may rest in peace. Now, Lord, you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people. A light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory, glory to, to the, the Father, Father and, and to the, the Son and, and to the, the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and shall, shall be forever. forever. Amen. Save us, O Lord, Lord while, while waking, waking and, and guard us while sleeping. sleeping that that awake we may watch with Christ, and and asleep may rest in peace. Visit this place, O Lord, we pray, and drive far from it the snares of the enemy. May your holy angels dwell with us, and guard us in peace, and may your blessing be always upon us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. Amen. Our Father, who Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As we come to the conclusion, we do so with the short prayer for Pat's aunt, Rose Cowling, and uh, Rose has died and Pat has just been to her aunt's funeral and she's asked if we could remember Rose in our prayers this evening, which I know we would be very pleased to do. And so, Father, we pray for Rose. We pray for all the members of her family who miss her. We pray that you will enfold her in your love and sustain those who mourn. So Father, may she rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen. In peace we will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make us dwell in safety. Abide with us, Lord Jesus, for the night is at hand and the day is now past. As the night watch looks for the morning, so do we look for you, O Christ. In a moment we're going to end this service with a short piece of music. At the end of that, please do, if you wish, leave. If members of the PCC could stay behind for a short meeting, I'd be very grateful. Thank you all very much indeed for your company, not only this evening, but throughout the past year. The Lord bless us and watch over us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord look kindly on us and give us peace. Amen.
Thank you all very much indeed, and a very good night to you all. If you have trouble sleeping, don't forget you can watch the video of this on the website. <laughs> Thank you all very much.